so welcome back after the refreshing coffee or tea or whatever um, so we have heard uh, a lot of science uh, about the plus four degree world and uh, so what we're going to do about this and we have uh, here three representatives from three different organizations there are two governmental agencies and one to call it an NGO uh, it's um, Mr. Harald Svensson on the, on the left there from the Swedish Board of Agriculture. He's a chief economist there. It's uh, Professor Anne Albin at the National Veterinary Institute and the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences. And it's uh, Mr. Bengt Persson. He's a board man member of the Federation of Swedish Farmers and a farmer with the mixed production of, of crops and, and beef. Uh, and we have instructed you that you should tell the audience, you will be given five minutes each to tell what you are going to do to cope with this uh, four, four degrees. So, Harald, may I ask you firstly to, to start? And then we will have a discussion, all of us here. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to uh, put the question, who is doing the job? Of course, uh, it is the whole, the whole population, including the farmers. And we at the Board of Agriculture is not doing the job. It's others who, who are doing the job. And I have some, uh, some uh, short remarks about uh, this uh, question about the four degrees warmer world. And uh, the first remark is, uh, for example, who is responsible for the CO2 emissions. Uh, when we talk about food, we often say that it is the farmers that are responsible for doing things so we not will get the situation with a warmer world. Of course then, this, um, I think that uh, this is wrong. Of course it have to be the consumers who demands the food. And, uh, they demand a mix of food, uh, meat and dairy products and uh, bread and vegetables and so on. So um, I have to say that uh, we have to, to change our mind in a, a little way uh, so that uh, the consumers will be more responsible than they have said to, to, to be before. The total CO2 emissions from uh, per, per capita in Sweden is about uh, 10 or 12 tons per, per person and uh, of that uh, comes about two tons from food and uh, these two tons is the, the sustainable amount in the long run and how do we, we get this uh, new situation for every one of us. Of course we can, uh, we can change the food, the, the mix of food uh, with uh, less meat and dairy products and uh, more of grains and so on. But then we have the other eight tons, uh, which is uh, fossil energy for flying transportation to, to Thailand and for vacations and so on. So I think that this is a, a bigger challenge that it is to, to change the mix of feed. Uh, we, have, uh, we have done a, a project at the Board of Agriculture uh, in cooperation with uh, the, the Swedish Environmental Agency uh, to prepare the situation for the year 2050. And uh, of course we can, we can see from our point of view that it's possible to, to change uh, the emissions, to decrease the emissions from food. But then uh, the other sectors of the society has a big responsibility for, for decreasing the emissions too. Uh, if we if you look at the farming system, uh, it is obvious that uh, high productivity is good for the climate. The higher productivity, the better it is often. Uh, in Sweden, we have a very good situation. I think we have a high productivity for our milking cows. Uh, milk production, as you perhaps know, is about 25% uh, of uh, the incomes to the agriculture in Sweden. Uh, 
And also we have uh, high productivity in grain production in those areas uh, uh, where the grain is, uh, is uh, grown. And um, we also see that, uh, of course, the situation doesn't change from one day to another. We have changes over a decade or two, but uh, uh, it is a, a very slow change from year to year. So therefore, uh, the work has to be in the very long run, I think. Uh, what then is the responsible responsibility for the Board of Agriculture? Okay, we are we are responsible for um, pest control, for example. We, uh, of, uh, the new climate situation will give a new situation about uh, pests for different crops or for animals. And also that the uh, situation for weed is, uh, is changing. So uh, we have to, to, pre to prepare ourselves. We have, uh, we have done uh, some reports on that and uh, we have had uh, some, um, some reports for the government for where we try to explain the, a possible new situation some decades away. Uh, and then... Um, a remark about the responsibility, who is responsible so that we will have changes in the economy or will have changes in the farming structure. As the politic is today, I think that it is the farmers which is responsible for, for changes, but uh, uh, I can't see that uh, it's, it would be possible for the, f the agriculture to get a new situation without a good support from uh, from the society as a whole, or the politics, if we can we can explain it with. Uh, we have um, we have had uh, uh, a session before in Swedish. It uh, was called uh, Markavattning i Sverige 2.0, and uh, the the new situation from for. Um, uh, water management when it was uh, discussed a lot. I think that uh, we have a, a big challenge the next decades of uh, how to, to organize a better situation for, for water, for handling of the water in the, in the nature and in the agricultural landscape, of course. And then um, my last remark uh, is about uh, the surplus of land in Sweden. Uh, my cal calculation uh, gives the result that we have about uh, 800,000 hectares of uh, land surplus in Sweden. So, if you understand me right, it's about 25 percent and uh, uh, this um, total animal production and production for human consumption will be it will be necessary with 75 uh, percent of this land that we have today and uh, how to uh, to um, have a situation where we can use this land this 800,000 hectares in the future we don't need it today or the profitability for this land is too low to um, to uh, be harvested every year. So I think that uh, this is that it have to be a responsibility for the society to to um, save this land for agricultural purposes, so that we can use it for my grandchildren or your grandchildren. Perhaps not for my child which is 20 years old, but for my grandchildren, I think it's needed. Okay, thank Th you very much. Thank you, Harald, very much for that. We continue f with uh, Anne. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, a main regular focus for the National Veterinary Institute is to work for better animal health. And this is both for production animals and for other animals. And um, uh, healthy animals are good 
due to many reasons, but they are good for the environment since they produce more and we just learned that high producing animals are good for uh, climate uh, mitigation uh, since they produce more of milk and meat and eggs and so on and they produce less of greenhouse gas emissions and uh, uh, manure and also they last for longer so the need for replacement animals is uh, not so big then if you have healthy animals uh, then, uh, among many things we do, uh, one new thing who are, I can say, directly due to the climate change problems is uh, that we have started to work with medical entomology. And uh, this is about uh, vector insects like uh, ticks and midgets and, and the mosquitoes because uh, they may transmit uh, diseases between uh, species and between individuals between individuals and um, we try to increase uh, uh, so everybody awake hmm? <laughs> uh, we try to increase the knowledge of which uh, species are present in Sweden and in uh, uh, which areas they are to be found and also how a cost efficient uh, surveillance of these uh, uh, creatures should be designed mm -hmm. and uh, these uh, arthropod vectors they take uh, benefit of a warmer and uh, humid climate so they they like this uh, climate change and uh, uh, a couple of examples of uh, diseases are blue tongue and schmallenberg um, they are two recently introduced exotic diseases as affect ruminants and they have cost a lot of money, both for farmers and taxpayers. Uh, Rift Valley fever, it's a zoonotic vector-borne disease, and zoonotic diseases may be transmitted between animals and uh, humans. And um, this disease uh, continuously kills a lot of people on a worldwide basis, and uh, it recently has uh, changed its uh, presence and slipped out from Africa to the Middle East. So these diseases we, we keep an extra eye on. Uh, and uh, also, since we incre uh, expect increased or changed patterns for precipitation, um, we also focus more on how diseases are transmitted by water and uh, by soil. Uh, heavy rain in, and flooding increase the risk for uh, the spread of domestic diseases like uh, Salmonella and VTEC. They are both uh, bacter bacteria zoonotic diseases as uh, may cause uh, serious health problems for humans. Uh, another regular focus for my institute is that um, and, and this may have gained uh, increased dignity due to climate change. It's to continuously improve our uh, possibilities for early warning systems. If there is an increased risk for a serious disease, we like to know that as soon as possible because then it's much easier to handle the problem. And here it's important to collect and uh, process complex information from many uh, different fields of expertise. Included here is also the possibility to diagnose unknown uh, uh, samples or unknown microbes in uh, samples and also to be able to handle large amount of samples in a very short uh, time period because if you have a disease outbreak it may come huge amounts of samples at the same time. Uh, so we continuously improve our diagnostic skills and the uh, surveillance of wildlife is also something as we have done for a very long time and uh, uh, if we do this in a good way it will increase our uh, possibilities for uh, early warnings uh, for disease outbreaks. So uh, to conclude, uh, a new subject for SVR is uh, the uh, vector-borne diseases and how to, to do the surveillance here in a cost-effective and efficient way. And uh, among things we already do and as may have gained a little more focus due to climate change, we have um, uh, 
to improve our possibilities for efficient warning systems and uh, uh, for to improve diagnostic so it better suits uh, new exotic diseases and uh, the surveillance of wildlife and the uh, disease transmission to water and soil is other focus so i think that was in short yeah, yeah. thank you and uh, Bengt, please five minutes thank you um, yes the question was how does we your organization prepare for for uh, four degrees warmer world but uh, we don't only prepare we also try to prevent what we can do uh, so we don't reach four degrees uh, and what what kind of work does uh, LRF do uh, we work in three areas new habits new technique and new strategies new habits uh, we work with one example of that is uh, godbase.se it was a session if in the, one of the um, sessions about that um, when we come to new technique and new strategies, uh, it, we have, together with the uh, HAL, taking uh, uh, a manual for water management um, to handle the, the more different climate with rain and, and drought. Um, we uh, work a lot with our members, the farmers, uh, both with ditching and uh, irrigation and to manage uh, these, um, these parts um, in uh, a climate change. Uh, to that we also work uh, to prevent building in, in arable land, uh, because we think we need the arable land in the future, and also the arable land is, uh, or the city land also is connected with water management, which uh, have impact in in uh, the agricultural water management. Um, we work uh, a lot with with uh, try to find new uh, technique to grow, uh, both when it get more more uh, wet on the fields. Um, and there is both uh, the management way to work with this and, and uh, the, the technique and the, the development of the, the technique in, in this area. Uh, we have a, I put a question in, in the, that session, uh, if we could get the farmers to invest more in ditching than in bigger uh, combines. And uh, they didn't think it was possible, but I also see that, that it's, uh, necessary to find new and a technique that is not so heavy that the technique we, we use today um, also uh, connected with the water management uh, uh, questions um, uh, we uh, work uh, in that when we, we uh, the knowledge transfer is one also in very important part of this new habits or the small changes, the gradually change, change, changing we work with. Um, so we try to uh, make in our research foundation a new way to get connection between research and uh, the pract practice. Uh, and all the chain between. Uh, so it's very important that we have the, um, the advisors um, or extensions people, an extension service, close connected in this uh, knowledge transfer. Um, then what do we do to um, prevent, prevent uh, um, the climate change. Yeah, we, we work uh, uh, a lot with uh, efficiency, more with less, a little what, what uh, Harald was into, uh, that we need to be very productive, productivity, a high productivity, but we need to have less input, uh, especially with the, the fossil energy. Um, 
So we work with uh, energy management, um, uh, nitrogen balances, um, and uh, we uh, work with the manure from, from the cattle uh, and the pigs. Um, and try to to reduce the climate uh, gases from from uh, from the animal production. Uh, we try to um, uh, get more uh, green energy in the agriculture sector that we can use and produce our own energy for uh, the purpose uh, both in in, uh, in the first. Uh, to, to uh, dry um, cereals and uh, also try to, to um, in, in, in the animal production, have um, heating systems that is, is uh, by green um, or produced by farmers. And the last one is that we have a goal that we should go from uh, one and a half terawatts today to five terawatts when it to deliver to the society uh, sustainable energy uh, uh, like wind, soil, and bioenergy. Uh, and uh, last but not least, we have together with uh, uh, Krav and Swed Swedish or Sven Seal. Uh, take a climate uh, uh, brand to the market for uh, food, and uh, that is used, uh, for example, by a Swedish uh, company uh, that's named Findus that have it on, on their uh, piece. Um, so that is what we do to try to both prevent and prepare. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I think now it's time for you, the audience. You've been so silent and <laughs> Please, questions. Hello, uh, my name is Maxim and I'm studying environmental economics and management here. And I have this question to Bend. Um, Harold mentioned this uh, really good thing that we are as consumers are re re very responsible for the things which are going on and the responsibility is really, there's a huge responsibility on us. But LRF is um, uh, more or less is now involved in this ongoing project, Bund de uh, How do you think, what role it can play in the consumer's education or interests in the source of the products? Like where are they going from, like really, you know, thinking of what we consume? Yeah, I think it can uh, play uh, play a role, but no, I don't know how big a role it can play in, in to to educate the, the consumers. Uh, uh, the use of it uh, goes up uh, every day, so probably we can contribute contribute to the knowledge about uh, also climate change in this uh, with this Bunda Okay, more comments. Question, someone? Yes, please. Yeah, hi, my name is David and I'm a master student here at SLU too. Um, I have a question for Harald uh, with the uh, Jordbruksverket. Uh, I think you have a kind of more of a system view than the individual entrepreneur, the farmer. So uh, I'm, I was thinking about the uh, the, the subsidies and the policy makers and your, how you can influence them. One example is that, for example, if you have an irrigation system and you drive it with diesel, mm -hmm. uh, you could just as well use it, use uh, sun energy or wind energy and use the, the peaks when it's a lot of air or a lot of sun to use that energy to drive straight into the system. But then we're, go then we're, uh, then we're in um, uh, net avgifter, uh, net fees and, uh, and things like this. And perhaps agriculture is one business that should have kind of special rules. What's your take on that? Okay, thank you very much. Um, as you perhaps know, in, we have in the European Union a, 
uh, rural programs, rural development programs, and uh, those programs can be used for such uh, measures, of course. And uh, uh, if we look back at uh, these programs that we have had the last years, from the year 2000 to up to uh, the year 2006 or seven, up to this year, we can see that. Uh, there are not so very measures about these questions that you ask for now, but perhaps it will be in the next, I don't know yet. Uh, this is uh, one method for us, and of course we, we uh, do different kind of reports that we, we uh, hand over to the government and they have to, to, prepare it, to, to prepare it for the society, but uh, it's so hard to say something more about that, I think. Can you can you put that into into goals for Jordbruksverket? We should push in this direction, or how do you how do you manage your work, your direction? Of course, we can have uh, goals for our own work, but then uh, we have to to take care of uh, of uh, the questions that uh, the government put in our hand. So. Uh, of course, we can have our own goals and work for them, but uh, uh, there is a need for, for support from the government, too. More comments, questions? I, I have one myself. It is, uh, you were a little bit uh, tame, all three of you, perhaps. Um, are you doing enough, giving the presentations this t today? Have you have you changed your mind, or are you still on the, on the right track, on the right speed, or have you changed your mind after the presentations today? And uh, no, I don't changed my mind. I don't think we do enough. <laughs> I would like to do much more. And uh, some years ago, we had some extra money from the government, and then we had the climate center, and could uh, broaden our view and focus more on these problems and so on. But then after three years, they thought we have solved the problem, so they don't give us any more money. And, uh, you know, about uh, the, uh, the money, that's what counts. So <laughs> today we don't do so much uh, specific for to adapt to the climate change. But of course, as I have told you, uh, we do a lot within our ordinary focus, but uh, we have not a special focus on these questions. And try, we don't try to solve them in a special way, as I would like us to do more than we do today. Okay, thank you. Harald, you, you elaborated a little bit about the different roles be between the individual farmer and the policy level, so to say. Where, where, where is your, wh what do you really mean? Could, could you, you explain it more? In, in detail, perhaps, or what is your wish or, or idea about this? Okay, perhaps um, uh, if, you, uh, if I go back to your first question now, I can say that for me, I have don't changed my mind. We have to, to work. Of course, perhaps we, I can say that we, we uh, ought to work harder than we have done before. Uh, and then according to the first question up uh, there, uh, what's then the problems for us? It is very cheap to consume. And it's very cheap to, to consume food. And we can see that uh, there are external effects for consumption. Not only for food consumption, but all consumption that uh, give uh, high CO2 emissions. And uh, what measures should we take to, uh, to get a new situation? Those measures, we, we don't talk so very much about measures. That, I think, is a problem for me. And then your question, which I have uh, forgotten now. <laughs> no, the the, the re division of responsibility okay, yes. between the, the individual farmer, yes. you, and the policy level. Of, thank you. Uh, it's not, I think it's not possible to, to say that one farmer shall be responsible for the climate change. It's a, a global phenomen, phenomenon. So therefore it's not a, a question for Sweden. And therefore I think that it's in, 
so long that the prices for for fossil energy is so low, it's impossible to get a, a very new situation. And therefore, I can't uh, I can't say to to uh, the farmer Kalle that you have to reduce your emissions. Or I can't say say to I, perhaps I can say to myself I shouldn't drive car so much that that I do. I, for myself, I, I I think I drive about five thousand kilometers only a year, so that's not so very much. But then my wife, she's driving a lot more because she she don't work in the same town in the same town as we live, so we have to to mix it up some way and and. Uh, it's a, it's a question about uh, external and effects and who they will be in, in turn in the calculations. If, if you go to, 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 uh, to you, Bengt, and your, your, your fellow farmers, uh, do you feel abandoned by, the, by the, the policy level and a kind of... Or do you get the support you want to, to adapt to, to the new climate situation for, or...? or do you feel alone, or? <laughs> no, I don't feel alone. <laughs> and I haven't changed, changed my mind. But uh, we, we must look at the farmer, and the farmer also look at his company. Uh, so as long as uh, competi competi competitiveness oh. and uh, climate... Uh, um, uh, work goes hand in hand. It's it's uh, good, and much of this is going hand in hand. Uh, if you work to be more efficient, uh, you get more competi competitive. So, um, but if you you look at uh, the policymakers, we don't have support no. And uh, also a question I, I always uh, put to myself is how long is uh, the relatively economical welfare in Sweden uh, last before someone else had the possibility to pay more or uh, for taking uh, actually uh, an example from just a week ago when China buys 5% of Ukraine's arable land. Uh, and that is probably not for going out on the open market. It's probably that the food should go to China. Uh, and then uh, the volume out on the open market will get less. And there, uh, therefore the price will rise. And so I think that the society, as member of the society, have to think very, very much how the future situation will be uh, if we don't take care of our arable land and our farms. Before you, and may I ask you, you, you are not that market oriented as these two gentlemen. You are, are supporting our society with some kind of public goods in, in terms of, of a better um, uh, public health situation, avoiding uh, dangerous diseases for humans, and so so you have to fight with the policy level to, mm -hmm. or the tax level. To, oh, mm -hmm. and, and do they listen to to you and your uh, mm -hmm. human medicine colleagues? Hmm. Uh, well, I think it should be much easier if we worked with uh, infrastructure, infrastructure adaptation, because then it's acute uh, weather conditions, and it's very obvious that we can't uh, go on like this. We need to secure roads and electricity and all these things. But then uh, talking about uh, animal and human health, it's a problem as uh, it may come tomorrow, but it uh, may be another 10 years before we have a serious disease outbreak. And uh, that's much harder to fight for because it's so many uh, acute problems as has to be solved and as we may have to focus on first. So I think uh, this, uh, this way to think is not so easy to the policymakers to, to get them to understand. They're so. re-elected every three years, yes. and this is beyond three-year period, yeah. Mm. Okay. Some more questions from the audience? Janne? I, I think this question is for Haaland, but perhaps <coughs> you don't like it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think
think it was you who highlighted that uh, we as consumers have, have a big responsibility. Um, and this question was actually discussed on several recent conferences on global food security that I was at. And <coughs> there it's ar really argued that uh, consumers don't have very much power as individuals. It's rather, in, in, that in the food chain system, it's rather uh, finance or large businesses or retailers that sit on the power on what the consumers are allowed to choose. And uh, marketers, of course, know this, so that they, they, they know how to handle uh, or to change people's preferences, for example. So I was thinking that aren't, don't we need any kind of policies to actually handle this uh, future agricultural problem? and the problem of having future agriculture land. Um, so my question is to you, what kind of policies do you think would be appropriate in order to uh, handle the fact that consumers may not have the power that we wish that mm -hmm. they had in a theoretical world? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a, a very good question, and uh, uh, I have to, to try to answer it. We are talking about a uh, global problem, we are talking about uh, external effects, and um, we are also talking about uh, uh, declining food prices, as well as declining prices for many other products, so that we can buy more and more. And um, uh, as I said before, we, we have a, a, a rather big surplus of land in agricultural land in Sweden. And uh, then perhaps the, the last question will be how to, uh, to uh, save or this agricultural land or how to survive until the prices will increase. Of course, they will increase someday. We don't know when. Uh, I, was, uh, I became interested in those things in, at about 1972 when I was a student in Lund. And uh, there was a food crisis in Sweden. I, 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 was, I thought that, uh, okay, this happy period with low food prices will be over now. But uh, 45 years later, uh, you can see that a rather long time ago, the prices are even lower than they was in 1972. So um, therefore, it's, uh, it, uh, from that we can, we can understand that it's not possible to say when the situation will be, uh, when we will get a new situation. But uh, of course, we have to prepare for a new situation. Okay. Thank you. Was there a question over there? Um, and the final question. Over this is a question for Anne and Harald. Um, I wonder when you when you see structure problems or, or you want to say the signals to the politicians, <coughs> here's something wrong, and they haven't asked those questions that are needed to answer. <laughs> <laughs> How do you send those signals then? Do you have the mandate to do it or or not? I mean, LF, you're working with um, uh, lobby lobbying yes. a lot. But as a, a member of um, uh, part of yeah, it's a question as it's not so easy to answer, maybe. But of course, we try to, to uh, uh, get attention for the questions as we think are important. And we may do so by asking for extra money to focus on the specific, a specific area. And um, uh, a few years ago, we usually got some, some extra money for some area each year. <laughs> but now they don't give us any extra. We have our basic level of money, and, and we get uh, almost the same every year. So if we need uh, to focus on uh, specific <coughs> problems, we have to fight for money from the uh, research councils and uh, from uh, EU money and um, yeah, together with everybody else. <laughs> So that's our possibility to, to lift up questions. Mm. Of course, we have the mandate. Mm. As I uh, said in my introduction, we had a uh, 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 work in cooperation with the uh, uh, National uh, Environmental Agency, 
with a report of for the year 2050 with uh, low or perhaps without CO2 emissions. And uh, I have to say that read that report and also read another report that will be uh, uh, published, perhaps it has been published already, about how to eat in 2050. For uh, it is published, thank you. So I think that uh, that uh, short report is uh, very interesting to read. Okay, Rainer. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's useful to say this group is more responsible or that group is more responsible. Of course, everyone, every actor along the value chain is partly responsible, and I think there's no way it has been clearly stated. So. Clim uh, greenhouse gas emissions are clearly an, uh, uh, an externality. So the only way to really um, change uh, behavior along the value chains is through pricing these emissions. Now imagine you have a, a carbon price of uh, 70 euro per ton of carbon dioxide, which some estimates are the social cost of carbon. So what would happen? The price of nitrogen fertilizer would certainly go up, so farmers would have an incentive to, to save on uh, nitrogen fertilizer. Meat would get more expensive. People would partly switch from meat to other, uh, to other food. And most importantly, all the industry along this value chain would have an incentive to invest in any activity uh, saving these emissions. So I think any kind of voluntary statement in terms of, yes, we will change our behavior, will only bring us small steps towards the solution, but but the price incentive on the emissions, and actually on all emissions from all sectors, and that actually includes methane and nitrous oxide from agriculture, um, will provide the right uh, framework. And But of course, because every societal group is affected, I guess it's very difficult to, to get this through in policy because there will be a lot of of opposition, but uh, basically, I think there's no way around this. I, I th thank you very much. I think your 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 statement also clearly showed the the interconnectivity between climate adaptation and mitigation. You were talking a little bit, maybe, uh, uh, about um, uh, mitigation, and uh, I I think we we have to we promise to be finished by by four, and um, um, I was having a final question, a yes, no one to you, but I think you, you, will not, you will not be able to, to answer it. <laughs> well, it's embarrassing, no, <laughs> it's difficult. Uh, but um, I think we skipped that one, actually. <laughs> but um, trying to summarize this day, which is an impossible task, uh, it's, I, I think, in the first presentation by... by um, it was a comment. I, I, I would very much make uh, an input on that. Yeah. Okay, a quick one. Yep. Yeah, the, also, I, I think, I think uh, it's a good idea that also, but uh, along the supply chain, uh, there is... Um, a different uh, strength in power between the players in along the supply chain, which means that uh, you need uh, somewhere to take the, this fee that you suggested, uh, probably in every part. Otherwise, uh, the last one in the supply chain moves the fee backwards, and uh, the first, which also is, is very strong, uh, move it forward. And the, the, the weakest part in the supply chain is the farmers. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, good idea, but you need to, to uh, uh, think a lot about where you take uh, this fee out. Otherwise, uh, you get, you are not harmed in the end of the chain, but in, in the, the, not in the beginning, but nearly in the beginning. Uh, the strength to, to put this forward in the chain is impossible. That means that you have to take it. And uh, it's also a comment to put uh, at Diana's question. 
the the retailers and um, and also uh, mostly of the big suppliers to the to the agriculture uh, say that they work with the climate change, but it's just talk and a lot. If you will call it greenwash, uh, so we need to to uh, uh, think a lot about how the supply chain in this matter uh, should uh, have have uh, regulations on their part. Thank you. Um, I think today, if I try to summarize this, I, I think in the morning it was very enlightening to, or not enlightening, but reminding us about the, the difference in the world when it comes to generate uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the, the ability or, or uh, how to say, the, how hit different countries are by the, by the climate change. It's a tremendous difference is there. The strong interconnection between agriculture, productivity, and, and, um, and um, the effects of climate change. We thank you very, very much for, 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 for that. I think it was a, a fantastic presentation. And then Perry Eric Orberg, I, I think also it was kind of astonishing that already what is have already happened in in uh, in our country, the, the changes that are, is already there, and uh, I, I hope that uh, really stirred up our our minds, and, and so we go out in the streets and and, and talk about this, and uh, uh, also that that I, I think this it, it was interesting to see. Um, the how to say the fluctuations, and we talk about extremes, and then we forgot that it was actually much more extreme some ten years ago. So, so this uh, everyday debate is 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 not how to say scientific or or, or um, based on on uh, on data. Really, it's I think it shows clearly how uh, individuals' perceptions of, of of things are. And that affects the debate in the, in the media, which in turn de affects the, the, the policy level or the political level. And I also want to thank the, the panel so very much. You, I think you, you have enlightened us in showing the, the, the complexity of, of this. And also, I think, if I understood you right, that we, are, are, we need more support from the, from the policy level or the political level that that have to de take this serious we we all all know this already but i think it's been re-emphasized uh, today and so i think we give a big hand to the panel and all to the all speakers today and thank you, thank you.